Hi everyone, welcome or welcome back to my channel. My name is Sid and in today's video I'm going to be talking about Dawn Brancho, Tilikum the Killer Whale and SeaWorld. Over the years of SeaWorld's existence, many safety measures were put into place to make sure it was a safe place to work at. Trainers learned how to go limp if they were grabbed by a whale. Whales were trained to swim towards one of the gates whenever a net was dropped in the water and how to keep their mouths closed and keep swimming if someone falls in the water. All of the staff members were aware where the safety equipment was stored around the park. Things like air horns, air tanks, safety nets, and a lot more stuff. Many employees had to enact these safety protocols because even though the killer whales were trained not to disobey their trainers, that wasn't always the case. Whenever there was an incident with a whale that required the emergency protocols, the blame was usually put on the trainer for why it happened to begin with. But Peters admitted when a whale went after him in 1999, the trainers involved made Made errors in reading the signs. But we we ended up with bruises and and even some broken bones. Had my rib cage busted. It wasn't sure. the killer whales being aggressive. It was mistakes we were making, and they were bumping into us. She said it was an incident documented in a SeaWorld report, but an incident she did not label aggressive. Even telling the judge she believes she failed by not requiring the whale to lay out first before she laid down next to it. While most of the SeaWorld visitors only knew the whales as Shamu, to the trainers they each had individual names and individual personalities. The killer whale at Tilikum had a particularly dangerous personality, so much so that there were specific emergency protocols put in place specifically for Tilikum. All new SeaWorld staff received what they called the Tilly Talk. Essentially the gist of that talk was that if you get in the water with Tilikum, you will not come out. So the first step in the protocol was to activate the siren. The second was to try and get air to the victim via a pony bottle and then unfurl a reel of netting. Since the whales were scared of nets, they could use them to try and corral them in other areas or try and separate the victim from the whale. And if Tilikum didn't respond to any of that, then the staff were required to repeat the process. In February 2010, Dawn Brancho was doing the Dine with Shamu show with Tilikum and she was doing everything right. At the end of the show she was lying in the shallow slide out area of the pool and holding Tilikum's pectoral fin. She followed all of the safety protocols and nothing she was doing was wrong but nothing could have saved her. That interaction ended in her death. And much like all of the other employees who had an incident with a whale, Dawn's boss blamed her for her death. Dawn if she was standing here with me right now would tell you that it was her that was her mistake um, in allowing that to happen. And TV personality and former zookeeper Jack Hanna, who always pops up to defend aquariums or zoos whenever an incident happens, also blamed Dawn. Sea World, I take my hat off to, brought that animal to their parks to give it a life, and that's what they did. And of course, an act, some kind of human error was involved. I believe this is me. I don't know what happened. And when there's human error involved with something like this, then things happen. Dawn was born in Cedar Lake, Indiana and was the youngest of six children. When she visited SeaWorld Orlando when she was nine years old, she became entranced with the killer whales and ever since then she wanted to become a trainer. In high school she excelled at whatever she put her mind to. She became class president and homecoming queen. After high school she went to the University of South Carolina. She graduated with degrees in psychology and animal behavior, which were the recommended degrees in order to get a job at SeaWorld. In 1994, when she was 24 years old, her dream came true, and she got a job at SeaWorld. Despite having her heart set on working with the whales, she first had to get some experience working with other animals in the park. So after spending two years working with the otters and the sea lions, she was permitted to work with the killer whales in 19. 96. That was also the same year she married her husband Scott, who also worked at SeaWorld as a stunt water skier. She was a very social and bubbly person, and it was no surprise to find out that she had a Christmas card list of over 250 people. She also had a big love for animals. She had two chocolate Labradors that she and Scott held birthdays for every year, and away from work she volunteered at the local animal shelter and kept a variety 
variety of ducks, chickens, rabbits, and small birds at her house, and she put just as much love and care into the animals at SeaWorld. Her dedication was recognized, and within two years, she was promoted from trainer to assistant trainer. In 2004, she got another promotion and became the assistant supervisor, and then in 2008, she became a supervisor. She became one of the most senior people in the entire animal training department. She had worked with nearly all of the killer whales that came through SeaWorld Orlando when she worked there. And she became approved for level three water work and water work in SeaWorld is working with the whales in the water. She was one of the few people in the park who were given the approval of doing every behavior in the whales repertoire, including hydros and rocket hops. She was a very valued member of SeaWorld. There were photos of her smiling next to killer whales that were later used on billboards and in other advertising campaigns for SeaWorld. She loved SeaWorld, animals, and even other people. She was growing out her ponytail, which she was about to snip off for the Locks of Love charity, which provides cancer patients with human hair wigs. But the upward trajectory of her life was abruptly stopped around 1.30 p.m. on February 24th, 2010. Before that time, she had been working the Dine with Shamu show, which involved SeaWorld's largest killer whale, Tilikum. During the show with Tilikum, he performed a bunch of behaviors for the crowd of people seated in the open an air cafe that wrapped around one side of the pool and after the show ended some visitors filed into the underground viewing area. It was at that point that Tilikum would swim down to the window and those visitors could get a photo with Tilikum. Above that viewing area was the shallow ledge where the whales could slide out if they wanted to, I mean required to. Dawn laid down in that shallow water that was just three inches deep while Tilikum idled beside her in the deeper water. The trainer Lynn Shaber, who was with the visitors at the underwater viewing area, shouted out to Dawn that she was ready to give Tilikum the signal to swim down to the window. But instead of doing that, Tilikum grabbed Dawn and dragged her into the water. The safety spotter Jan Topelski, who probably wasn't being as attentive as he should have been, activated the alarm as soon as he saw what was happening. The visitors below watched as Dawn was dragged through the water and saw at one point Dawn managed to break free and swim towards the surface only to be seized again by Tilikum. The staff member with the visitors quickly ushered them away, but Tilikum continued to drag Dawn around the water, and he did it in such a violent way that she was left with a broken jaw, a fractured vertebrae, multiple broken ribs, she was scalped. At the surface, staff were slapping the water, signaling for Tilly to leave her. They threw weighted nets into the water to try and and corral Tilikum into the medical pool which had a lifting floor and when they were able to do that he was still very uncontrollable. Dawn was eventually able to get free from Tilikum but only when part of her arm broke off which at that point she was completely unresponsive. Paramedics did try and resuscitate her but were unsuccessful. Her body was then covered with a sheet and Tilikum peered over the side of the pool at her body. The autopsy declared that she died of drowning and traumatic injuries. Years later, after the Occupational Health and Safety Administration conducted an investigation, the judge Ken Welsh said, all of the emergency procedures, nets, underwater signals, and hand slaps are useless if the whale chooses to ignore them. After the incident, the Orange County Sheriff's Office took witness statements from over 40 people. The vast majority of witnesses were SeaWorld staff who were only present long after Dawn had been in the water. Detectives only interviewed two guests that day. One of those guests was from Florida and she was at the surface level when it happened. The other one was a tourist from the Netherlands 
Netherlands, who was at the underwater viewing area. The person from Florida said that they just saw a person in a black and white wetsuit in the water and knew it was serious when they saw her Tiva come off. The tourist from Netherlands said they didn't see how Tilikum pulled Dawn into the water, but when he dragged her in front of the viewing area, he had her by her shoulder. There were two people who were interviewed who did supposedly see how Dawn was dragged into the water. Jan Topelski, the safety spotter, and a security guard. The security guard said that Tilly grabbed Dawn by her arm, and Jan said that Tilly bit down on a piece of Dawn's hair and she was unable to release it from his mouth. Even though some of the witness accounts did contradict each other, they were pretty consistent in that Dawn was dragged into the water in some way or another. But for some reason, the sheriff's department announced that Dawn slipped or fell into the water. What apparently happens, we had a female trainer uh, back in the whale holding area. She apparently slipped or fell into the tank and was fatally injured by one of the whales. Later that day, a number of other witnesses who weren't interviewed by detectives came forward to speak to the media. The family who recorded Dawn's last moments with Tilikum said they saw Tilikum drag Dawn in by her head. Turned, he grabbed her by the head, and in a very hard thrust, she went down, and I screamed, and she screamed, and then I started yelling to the other trainer because he wasn't looking. I said, he just took her down, he took her down and I knew it wasn't a playful act. And, and then he ran with the yellow box and started banging it. I guess there's a box they have that's supposed to get the whale away from the person and it wasn't working, then he ran and sounded the alarm. There was also an underwater camera that didn't capture how Dawn was dragged into the water, but it did capture what Dawn went through under the water. A splash is visible on the screen. A few seconds later, Tilikum is seen swimming into view. Seconds later, Brancho is free and actually tries to swim to the service, according to the Sheriff's Office report. Then Tilikum strikes Brancho as she tries to swim to the surface, and then Brancho tries once again to surface just a few seconds later, and then Tillicum takes Brand Show in his mouth and swims away from the camera. Four and a half minutes go by according to the timestamp on the video, and Brand Show is still in his mouth and she appears lifeless. SeaWorld made statements that nothing was wrong with Tillicum that day, but witnesses soon came forward again to dispute that claim. One witness sent an email to the Orange County Sheriff's Department saying that they were present for a whale show earlier in the day. And during that show, the whales started chasing each other, but the person was unsure if one of those whales was Tilikum. Another person who witnessed the dysfunction of the earlier show spoke to the media, assuming that Tilikum must have been one of the agitated whales in the previous show. A tourist at an earlier show said the animal seemed agitated. I just I, I wish and pray that they hadn't gotten in the pool since the whale was clear that it was upset and um, you know, just my prayers go to that person's family. The animal curator denied that Tilikum was acting abnormally. We're getting reports this morning. We've spoken with people who say that the whale was behaving strangely yesterday, was agitated and, and wasn't quite uh, normal in previous shows. Did trainers ignore these warning signs yesterday? Uh, that information is inaccurate. Uh, she had a great session with that animal prior to the incident. And at first, SeaWorld actually didn't release the name of the offending whale. It wasn't until a SeaWorld employee who asked not to be identified came forward to a news station and revealed that it was Tilikum. It's not surprising that SeaWorld executives didn't volunteer that information when it first happened, considering that Tilikum was involved in the deaths of two people previously. In 1991, he was involved in the death of Kelty Burns. Also in the pool with Tilikum were two female orcas who bullied and injured him. And while they were also involved in the death of Kelty, it was Tilikum who refused to give up her body for over two hours. In 1999, Daniel Jukes was found dead in the pool where Tilikum was isolated, and Tilikum didn't give up the body then 
Dan and had to be herded into the pool with the medical lift, which is similar to Dawn's accident, which took 45 minutes to retrieve her body. Tilly was always shunned by the other orcas and usually always kept separate from them. That was the reality of his life for the majority of his life in captivity. All of the orca pools in SeaWorld are connected, but they are separated with gates made of bars. So if mayhem was taking place amongst the other orcas in SeaWorld, world, Tilikum would have known about it, and he may have also been unsettled by it. Killer whales are smart, sociable, and forge tight bonds with one another. Pods of killer whales are matriarchal groups, and the males are especially dependent on their mothers, even in adulthood. If a male killer whale's mother dies after he reaches maturity, he is three more times likely to die the following year. John Hargrove, a former SeaWorld employee from before and after Dawn's death, wrote a book called Beneath the Surface. In that book, he talked about how Tilikum displayed mourning-like behavior as if a member of his pod had died when Dawn died. Emotional pain for whales, because it is so much part of their social existence, might then be of a higher magnitude than for human beings. It makes it almost possible to apply the word mourning to the fact that the male orcas can often waste away and perish after the death of their mothers, the dominant centers of their social existence. I was told by trainers in Florida that Tilikum exhibited what they described as mourning behavior after he killed Don. It will never be clear why Tilly did what he did to Kelty, Daniel, and Dawn, but it is largely speculated that it may have been a sign of frustration due to inadequate living conditions, aggression, or he just saw them as a toy to play with. But he also could have seen them as something that could provide him with the companionship that he wasn't getting from any of the other orcas and didn't want to let go of it. After what happened to Dawn, questions were raised about potential euthanasia, but SeaWorld said they wouldn't ever do something to punish the whales. But Atchison says Telecom will stay part of the SeaWorld team. We would never advocate punishing an animal of ours. That is something we won't entertain, we will not do, it is not part of our DNA. But they still kept him in isolation and limited his presence in the shows. He actually did have one female orca companion. Her name was Tama and she was really only ever interested in being around him when she was sexually active. He fathered all four of her children but she unfortunately died during the fourth birth due to complications. That was on June 6th 2010, just a few months after what happened to Dawn. So in the span of a few months, he lost one of the only trainers who was allowed to go near him. He lost one of the only killer whales who would occasionally go near him and he also was significantly more isolated. And then he almost lost his life. He fell seriously ill and was heavily medicated, and he was actually given some medications that were usually only given as a last resort. He lost over a thousand pounds, and it was likely he wasn't going to make it, but he did end up pulling through. Then in 2016, he got sick again, from a progressive form of bacterial pneumonia. He spent months languishing and passed away on January 6th, 2017 at roughly 36 years old. But before that, as soon as Dawn died, SeaWorld stopped allowing its trainers in the water with the whales. OSHA spent six months investigating SeaWorld Orlando's killer whale shows as well as the safety of its trainers. When it came to court, a number of the SeaWorld trainers testified, including the safety spotter. When it came to court, a number of SeaWorld employees testified including the safety spotter for Dawn. He admitted that he assumed Tilikum grabbed Dawn's hair, but he did see her get to her knees to try and free her hair from Tilikum's mouth. Now, during the spotter's testimony, OSHA pushed him to say that he wasn't really sure that it was her ponytail that was in the whale's mouth, that he just saw her underwater and he assumed it was the ponytail. Shortly after this, the spotter says Brancho struggled to her knees, working to pull her ponytail free with both hands. She could. Ever since the incident happened, SeaWorld has said that it happened because of Dawn's ponytail. We don't understand what was going through his head. He grabbed her ponytail and pulled her underwater. 
even though a number of trainers have had ponytails or long hair around Tilikum before. And the reason there is such an emphasis on Dawn's ponytail is because it gives SeaWorld a way to shift all of the blame onto Dawn as well as offer an easy solution. The solution would be to simply stop allowing trainers to wear their hair like that around the whales. But in court, OSHA wanted far more than that put in place to protect the trainers. At one point, the attorney for OSHA suggested that SeaWorld only makes amendments to its safety protocols when they get bad press. OSHA lawyer John Black suggested to Clark that SeaWorld only changes its safety protocol when an incident gets widespread media attention, as it did in the death of trainer Don Brancho. And the judge ultimately sided with OSHA. The agency issued several citations saying barriers and other precautions were needed for the shows. They also fined SeaWorld $75,000 but of course, SeaWorld then appealed the violations. The case then went to a three-judge panel where SeaWorld lost by a vote of two to one. They said that SeaWorld had violated its duties as an employee by exposing trainers to recognized hazards when working with killer whales. It wasn't all bad for SeaWorld though. The judge, Ken Welsh, reduced the OSHA fine to $12,000, but ruled that trainers must be physically separated from killer whales during performances. SeaWorld had to correct the citations they received from OSHA, and they also wanted to be allowed to have trainers in the water with the whales again. SeaWorld did need to make some significant changes, so one of the first things they did was request a six month extension. Then in December 2012, OSHA requested a subpoena stating that SeaWorld declined to provide three employees to be interviewed during a follow-up inspection in order to determine if the hazards had been fixed. Then in April 2013, SeaWorld asked for another six-month extension. In June 2013, OSHA issued a $38,500 fine for repeat safety violations found during its December 2012 inspection. So SeaWorld added floors that would float in emergencies in some of the orca tanks and inflatable safety vests with an air canister. But John Hargrove didn't think the vests would be effective. He says he was part of the vest testing before he left SeaWorld in the summer of 2012 and says they're nothing short of dangerous, giving the killer whales something else to grab onto. It's amazing to me that they're making trainers wear something that, are, that is creating a drowning hazard for trainers. I'm glad I'm not there anymore because I would not be wearing this equipment. Despite making these changes, SeaWorld lost the overall court battle and weren't ever allowed to have trainers in the water with killer whales again. Even though they lost one of the park's biggest spectacles, in 2011, the year after Dawn's death, SeaWorld apparently had a record year. The CEO of SeaWorld, Jim Atchison, told the Orlando Sentinel that SeaWorld had a 5% increase in visitors, which is the first time numbers rose since 2008. He also said he expects the growth to continue and said, I wouldn't expect us to have any kind of contraction at all. But the growth of SeaWorld came to a stop when in 2013, the documentary Blackfish was released. Anyways, that is pretty much everything for this video. Thank you so much for watching. Let's take a moment of silence for all of the killer whales still in captivity. And I will see you in my next video.